Good morning, church. I knew we left that in capable hands. I knew he could do it. We begin a series of lessons this morning on Jesus is. This is the season where everybody thinks about Jesus, and I'm thankful for that. I just wish they'd do it the 11, other 11 months of the year. But nevertheless, I think it's fitting in many ways for us to spend time talking about Jesus. Actually, the song that you just sang was written in 1938 by a man by that sometimes his last name is called Fisher, but Boyce was his last name. It was written actually in Rutherford County, not far from here. Mr. Fisher was, uh, Mr. Boyce, excuse me, was a, an individual that was a dairy farmer. But he was also a man that was quite moved by music. And in that day and age, there were things called music schools. And that's where individuals that loved to sing would go and learn to sing and learn about music and learn how to sing. And he often attended music schools. Now, he was not a member of the church as we think of it, but nevertheless, a very religious man in his own right with his own faith and his own beliefs. Mr. Fisher Mr. Boyce, he actually, in 1938, he went out to his barn because that's where he liked to write his songs. And sitting on a stool where he often milked his cows, he sat and he wrote that song, Beautiful Star of Bethlehem. It so captures what I want to say this morning in, in a beautiful way, how I want to start this series off. Because we do understand that the Bible tells us Jesus makes the statement, as we'll see later on in our lesson, that he's the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. It is important to us to understand Jesus and the roles that he plays in the world, in society, and in our life. And by all means, Jesus should be the light in your life. And hopefully he is. And more than likely you would say, preacher, that's kind of redundant. I'm here at church on Sunday morning. The answer to that is yes. But sometimes we put on masks and we play roles. It's important, though, for us to remember that Jesus is the light that guides men on their way. It's a beautiful song. It's a song that I, I dearly love. It's one of my probably top 10 songs that I like, and I wish we sang it year-round and sang it often. I had a request years ago. Uh, Walnut Street in Dixon used to have a, a thanks singing every the Sunday night right before Thanksgiving. They'd invite area congregations, and, and sometimes I would go after church. I'd go at Pomona. I'd run over there, and, and I told the, the preacher there at one time, I said, I didn't like your service tonight, and or last night we were together on Monday, and he said, why not? I said, you put my favorite song right at number one on the list. He said, yes, I know, because we all love it. And I said, yes. But I said, you need to understand, if you were sitting towards the back like I was, the congregation didn't get in full throat till about the third song. And I said, if you were listening, it was kind of interesting because about the third song, about the second stanza, I said, everybody's voice is meshed, and they meshed the rest of the night. He said, oh. I said, so next year, put that down about three or four, if you don't mind. It's message, though, not only the songs, the notes, but the message is true. Jesus is our light. But why is that so important to us? And what really does that do for us? Well, we have to understand what light does. The first thing we understand is light, light banishes darkness. Light removes darkness. We we'll often talk about lights to, today, this morning, and going into dark rooms. But imagine, if you will, going into a dark room at night in your house. What's one of the first things you do? You turn on the light. Why do you turn on the light? So that the darkness will be removed so that you can see. We appreciate our light. Remember, not that awfully long ago, our forefathers, at night when it got dark, first of all, they probably went to bed, but if they didn't, they only had a fire and maybe a candle. Or maybe if they were fortunate enough, 
a lantern, a coal oil lantern at that. But they were thankful for that light. Why? Because they could see in the midst of the darkness. Light banishes darkness. No matter how hard darkness tries, no matter how thick and how deep darkness is, when light enters into that area where it is, darkness is banished. Now think about that for a minute. In the Bible, darkness is representational of Satan and the works of evil. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul talks about in verse 17 and 18 that you're not to walk anymore in the way of the Gentiles, in the way of the world, if you will, in the futility of their mind. In the powers, the very next verse says, in the powers of darkness. In the ways of Satan, in the ways of sin. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against darkness. Paul would write in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. And while there are those that say that they love God, they still, according to 1 John 1 verse 6, they walk in darkness. Why? Because they do not really love him. Darkness then is portrayed in the Bible as that which is evil, Satan's work, Satan's handiwork, Satan's ultimate, if you will, Even hell in some verses are described as a place of darkness. And the sad part is that when Jesus would talk about being light in John chapter 3, he would say that there's darkness in the world and men, verse 19, love the darkness more than they love the light because their deeds are evil. But Jesus who John chapter 1 and verse 5 says that he is he is life and light to me. And then it talks about, if you look in John chapter 1, it talks about John the Baptist, John the Baptizer being, if you will, the forerunner to bring us to light, to the light. Jesus as light removes that darkness. And while John chapter 3, Jesus would say that there are those that love the darkness more than they love the light, he says they do that because, John 3 verse 20, their their deeds are evil and they do not love the light. If, If light banishes darkness, then what this means is that Jesus removes that film of darkness in the lives of mankind. That Jesus gives us the light that we need. Have you ever been in darkness? I mean pitch darkness. Now you're going to have to go outside Nashville to get an absolute pitch darkness. Maybe you've gone into a cave. And you could not see even your hand in front of your face. And I visited the cave once and they sat us down because darkness becomes very disorienting. They sat us down. They turned out all the lights, and it was so dark in there, literally, that I I wanted to see. I'd heard this before, but I wanted to see. So I took my hand, and I kind of knew where it was. And I moved it towards my face, and I didn't see it, even when it touched my nose. That's dark. Jesus, then, just as that in that cave when they turned back on the light. Why, yes, I could see not only my hands and I could see the rest of my body. I could see Suzanne. I could see Ethan. He was with us. I could see the folks that were in the group with us. Light did that. It removed that darkness. Jesus came. According to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8, Jesus came. To do what? To destroy him that is the master of darkness. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 8, John would write that he who sins, he he who sins is of the devil, for the devil sins from the beginning for this purpose. The Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of darkness. Jesus came to Banish that darkness. 
remove that darkness, to, to give us the light to see, to give us the light to show us the way. For Jesus said that the thief comes but for to steal and kill and destroy. I've come to give you life. And so he does that by banishing the darkness. But light also guides us. Light also guides us. Once again, go back to the dark room in your house. Go back to the darkness in your house. Have you ever walked into a room and you get there and you think, I don't need to turn the light on because, number one, I know where I'm going. Number two, I've been in this room for 20 years now. I know where everything is. And I'm just going right over there and get what I need and walk out. And when you get over there and you begin to walk out, you trip over something. You ever done that? Am I the only? No, don't raise your hand. We've all been there, done that. Yeah, I'm going to do that. I was in the basement the other day. There's something there's been there ever since we moved there. Three years now, almost four. I thought, I don't need the light for them. I kicked that thing. I've been around it, no telling how many times. That's what light does, though, because I thought, you know, if I'd only had the light on, I wouldn't have kicked it. We've all been there. We've all done that. That's what light does, though. It guides us. It shows us the way. Think about the times the light was used to guide the children of Israel. In the book of Exodus, the 13th chapter, the children of Israel are wandering in the wilderness. Remember now, Ben Franklin had not been around. He had not, if you will, discovered street lights. So consequently, not only were the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness and needing to know where to go in the daylight, they needed light at night. And so there was a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night that led them through the wilderness so that they could see where they was going, so that they could understand and they could be led in a direction. And so light was used to guide the children of Israel. But how about in Matthew chapter 2, in the story of Jesus' birth? How about the fact that there, the wise men, the shepherd, if you will, were guided by the light, by a light that they saw it whilst tending if you will, out in the meadows, they saw this light and that light guided them in the way that they needed to go to find, if you will, the Savior. Light guides us. It shows us the way. It illuminates the way, but it shows us the way. It guides us in the way that, that we need to go. Why? Because there are many false things that are out there. There are many false teachers. Satan, who we just talked about in the first point. Satan, the master of disguises, the master of deception. Satan is constantly at work. Blind the eyes of mankind. To blind them to the goodness. To lead them astray in his way. And someone needs to come along and brighten the day, lighten the day, throw light upon the subject so that it can guide us. Jesus does that as our light. He gives us the light to guide us along the way that we should go, to know what is wrong, but to know what is right, to understand that we're not, as Paul would say, we're not ignorant of his devices. Talking about Satan, we're not ignorant of his, Satan's devices. We understand the tricks and we understand the tools and we understand the false teachers that he uses to lead men astray. And while we are not ignorant of those things, we need to understand that there had to be some light thrown upon the subject to guide us in the way that we should go. And that light is Jesus. You see, Jesus is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He proclaimed that in a very bold statement in John 14, in verse 6. I'm the one that will guide you. I'm the one that will carry you home. I'm the one that will carry you to eternity and to your eternal rest. And so what does he do? He bid those in his life. And he bids all of us, not just simply coming to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. 
But he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I'm meek and lowly in heart. You shall find rest into your souls. Take my yoke. The word yoke can have actually two different meanings. We often apply it to the idea of the yoking of two animals together in order maybe to pull the plow. But the idea of a yoke also in first century times was the idea of joining yourself to a teacher. And so when you joined yourself to a teacher, because you see, you didn't have public schools. You didn't just go to a public school. You had to find somebody that was willing to teach you. You had to employ them, if you will, as a teacher. And when you did, you were said to yoke yourself to that teacher. And Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Come follow me. Let me let me guide you, whether it's my teacher or whether it's the, if you will, the 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 one that I'm yoked to that leads the way. Let me be the one that follows you. Let me be the one that allows you to guide me in the way that I should go, that allows you to, to show me the way. All would write. To the church at Thessalonica in First Thessalonians chapter one verse six, they was basically proud of them. Actually, First Thessalonians chapter one, in many ways, is what Paul had prayed for with regards to the Thessalonica. But it's also, if you will, a great recommendation and commendation of a church that Paul saw much good in. In verse six, what were they doing? They were following the Lord. They were not leading the Lord. They were not working with the Lord, which is a very scriptural idea, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. But they were following the Lord. They were walking in his steps. They were walking as he walked. They were following his lead and allowing him to lead. And so they might be said to allow him to guide them. They were walking in the light as he's in the light. And they were having fellowship one with another. They were a church then that was doing what God would have to do, and they were not leaving that light. You see, man's prone to do that. Second John 9, John would write that whoever transgresses and bides not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. Whoever transgresses goes beyond and does not remain, if you will, in that light, does not remain bound and yoked to that teacher, does not allow him to lead them. He transgresses and he abides not in the doctrine of Christ. He has not God. He has gone beyond. He has changed. He has manipulated the way of God to his own will and his own way and his own doings. He's left the light. I think I shared with you the story of Richard Morse recently. Richard Morse was a Canadian. He was actually at one time he had served in, in the military of the Canadian. He had of Canada, excuse me. He had actually flown some of their planes. One evening late, he heard planes overhead and he ran out and he could tell that they were in distress and he ran back into the house and he grabbed some flashlights and he began spotlighting in the fields beside his house. He was spotlighting the trees and the, the, the land there. And sure enough, the plane that he heard that was in distress used his guiding mechanisms with his flashlights to land the plane safely in a field beside Richard's house. Jesus gives us the light so that we can, if you will, land safely, so that we can land, if you will, with him. Jesus, as the light, then guides us on our way home. But as that light, Jesus reveals that's what light does. It reveals. It reveals what maybe even we know is in the darkness. It reveals those very items. Once again, go back into that dark room. I remember a while ago, you didn't turn the light on. What did you do? You stumbled over what was in the room. Now you go and you flip the switch on. 
You turn the light on, and what does it do? It reveals the shoes that you left in the middle of the floor. Shame on you. It reveals the pile of clothes over there that you need to take to the wash. It reveals to you the exact place where what you want in that room is. You're able, by the blessing of sight, to see exactly what is there. It has illuminated, it has revealed everything so that there's no guessing. I don't have to remember where I left those shoes. I don't have to remember where we left the su such and such in the floor. I don't have to remember. It's the I see it. Why? Because the light revealed it. The light made it known. The, the light showed it to me. Jesus, as my light, reveals me the midst of darkness, what I need to know. In the book of John, in John, the 14th chapter, when Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me, that verse we looked at earlier. You remember there's a question by Philip. Lord, when, you know, explain this to us. And Jesus, beginning then, about verse 9, Asked Philip this question, have I been so long with you that you've not seen me? He who's seen me has seen the Father. You see, Jesus came to this world, and as we're going to talk about next week, Jesus came to save the world, but Jesus came to this world to be the light that we needed, and being the light that we needed and shining and letting us see he reveals to us the Father. We studied in the month of November on Sunday nights, we studied some of the attributes of God, and most notably the care that God gives to us, and we broke it all down. As we think about God and we think about the, the magnificence of, of God and what he does for us, we still sometimes stand in awe of God and still scratch our heads and wonder, you know, I just, I have a hard time really getting my mind around the concept, if you call it that, of God. It's just hard to imagine that omniscient, omnibeing, that omnipresent, that omnipotent God. It's just hard to get our finite minds around an infinite being. And it is, no matter how much we study. But Jesus said, you want to know about God? You want to know about how he is and you know about how he does and the kind of person, if you will, that he is? He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And so Jesus revealed the Father, but he also not only revealed the Father, but he revealed the beautiful way of holiness. Remember, Peter said that Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. First Peter chapter three or two, excuse me, verse 21. Peter says Christ came to show us the beauty of holiness. Why, that, why is that so important? Because Jesus in his light revealed the darkness of sin. Do you remember when Jesus came in Luke chapter 4 and he came upon a man by the name of Peter? And Peter had been fishing. Jesus, you know, he hadn't caught anything. Jesus said, cast your nets over on the other. And they did, and they caught this bounty of fish. And when he came up on the shore, he asked Jesus to depart from him. Do you remember why? He says, for I am a sinful man. I'm not able to stand in your presence. I am an individual that needs what you're going to give. And so Jesus came to reveal not only the sin in man's life, but the beauty of holiness as he left us an example to follow. And then ultimately, he reveals that beautiful plan of salvation. Like I say, we're going to talk about that next week. But John 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have life everlasting. Jesus reveals not only what, if you will, we need to know, but what we must know. 
and he reveals to us the possibilities that are there. Just look and see God, see his holiness, see his greatness, see his power, see his salvation, see him, but see yourself as you are, as Peter did. And so Jesus, as our light, reveals not only, if you will, us to us, but reveals God to us. And we get a great picture. But Jesus, as our light, is a light of hope. Beautiful star of Bethlehem. Shine upon us until the glory dawns. Yep. The light of hope. Jesus came into this world and men did not accept him. He was born very simple life, very simple lifestyle. He was not born to the rich. He was not born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He was not born into a big house. He was not born into a place of authority from a standpoint physically. When he came to this world, He told folks exactly who he was. He told them that he was the Christ that God had prophesied would come. He told them that he was the one that was to that had come to preach deliverance to the captives or in the setting of uh, the recovering of sight to blind and to set at liberty those that are bruised. Luke chapter four. He came for that purpose. And so from that point in time onward. Those that had probably known him, those that had watched him, if you will, be a baby, be a toddler, be a baby in his mom's and dad's arms, be a toddler that that just walked through the streets to being an individual that as a carpenter's son, he's learning the trade to being the one who now, according to, to Luke chapter 4, proclaimed to be the Messiah. And just as the prophets had said, They rejected him. They wanted nothing to do with him. They claimed not that he was the Messiah, not that he was the the Son of God. They claimed not that he was the Savior, but that he was a fraud. And he was perpetrating a hoax. And so consequently, through a devised scheme and plan that they plotted and actually pulled off, They crucified him. They carried him outside the the gates of the city. They nailed him to a cross. And when he was nailed there to that cross, the darkness of the day showed forth, not only from a standpoint of literally, but but spiritually as well. And then, As a text that we read in Bible school this morning, he gave up the ghost. He died. Just like one day you and I will, he died. When he was put in that tomb, however, a borrowed tomb, once again, shows really the poverty of his life. When he was placed in that tomb, and they came after the Sabbath the next day, to finally really prepare his body for burial. What did they find? Not him. They found an angel which proclaimed, he is not here, he is risen. This tomb didn't hold him. And so, for many days afterwards, Jesus, upon the face of this earth, showed himself, many individuals because he had come forth as Paul said in Romans chapter 1 as the seed of David he had come forth out of the grave he rose why is that so important well it's important because Paul would kind of capsulize it in 1 Corinthians 15 he begins in 1 Corinthians 15 he says You know, this gospel which I preached to you, which also you have received and wherein you stand, if you keep in memory what I've preached unto you, unless you've believed in vain. He summarized exactly the gospel, how that Christ died, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. 
And then he begins a discourse there in 1 Corinthians 15, a discourse that talks about if in this life only we have hope in Jesus Christ, we are of all men most miserable or most pitiable. And as Paul talks about, he says, our faith is vain. Our preaching is worthless. There's no reason for life. But you keep reading that 15th chapter and you're reminded, but he did come forth out of that grave. He did come forth as a light, as a beacon of hope to let us know and let us understand that one day we too can be raised from that grave. That one day we too will stand before the Lord on the day of judgment. And one day we too can hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the gates prepared for you. Jesus is our light of hope. That once this world is finished and once we breathe our last breath and sigh our last sigh, it's not over. Because Christ rose, we do as well. And so Jesus came as the light of the world to be a light of hope so that we may understand there is something to live for. There is a purpose in our life, and there is a reason to live this life. In John 8, verse 12, Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. I want you to notice a couple of things in that verse. I want you to notice, first of all, Jesus said to them, I am the light. I'm not a light. I'm not some light. I'm not a possible light. I am the absolute, without a doubt, unequivocal, the light. Notice who he says that he's the light to. He says, I'm the light to the world, to everybody, not just those in the wonderful and beautiful state of Tennessee, not just those, if you will, that, that live in the great United States of America. I'm a light to the world. And if you'll walk with me, if you'll let me be the light that reveals, the light that guides, the light that provides the hope, the light that will remove the darkness in your life, if you'll let me be that light, he says, he says you'll not walk in darkness, but you'll have the light of life. This morning, are you following him? Is he the light of your life? If not, you can change that. If he was at one time, but he's not anymore, he's calling you. He's bidding you. He's begging you to come. All together we stand and say.